Hi everybody, welcome back to another video on my channel. My name is May and I am a final year vet student at Cambridge and today we have the honor of having Callum Mc... Mc sorry. No, Callum no. McIntyre from Edinburgh. And yeah, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi there all, my name's Callum. As you can tell from the kind of thick Glaswegian accent, I'm quite north in the UK. So originally from Glasgow, but now study in Edinburgh. I'm just entering my fourth year now. So time is really flying by fast and, and getting ready for that penultimate final year. And then going off into the, the big bad world, as they say, as, as a, a graduated vet, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for agreeing to be on this call. I think your, your insight about Edinburgh Vet School will be very useful, especially for for potential vet applicants who want to study here. So I guess, would you like to tell us how did you apply to Edinburgh and why did you decide to choose Edinburgh Vet School? Yeah, so my, my application was quite strange circumstances. So I'm now 23, so I left school in, in 2015. And, and when I left, I didn't have the grades at all. I fell very short in grades and ended up doing a lot of work experience to try and, and make up for that. From there, uh, when I applied, I didn't get in first time either. And it took a lot of kind of grit and, re and reassurance and support from parents and family to get me over the hurdle and apply for a second time after two years out and Edinburgh was actually my only offer. It was almost fate in itself that it came calling and since I got to Edinburgh it's, it's been a, a bit of a, a harmony that it just seems to have fitted right in for me. Oh that's really cool. So with your application did you do did you do A-levels or a different kind of? So in, in Scotland we do what we call hires and advanced hires. Mm -hmm. So very similar to GCSEs and A-levels and there you're kind of entry into university and I struggled because I didn't do chemistry at higher um, mm -hmm. obviously veterinary is a very science-based degree and I had to then go away and do it as a crash hire without no previous experience or knowledge oh, and wow. then teach myself part of the advanced hire of course in my years out whilst working and, and, and things like that so it was, it was a different experience I, I refer to it as the scenic route into <laughs> Um, so yeah, but I think the main thing that that really did for me was it bolstered a lot of skills out with of just academics and learning. With two years out, I worked full time and, and got work experience. And that was varying from laboring on farms through to experience in small animal vet, all the way through to handling exotics and, and pet shops and things. Oh, wow. It sounds like you had so much work experience before you even started university. Yeah. And I, I think the one thing I reiterate to a lot of, a lot of peers and, and friends that chat about prospective applicants is that there's more than one way into vet school. Uh -huh. uh, we put too much pressure on ourselves sometimes with grades. I'm sure as a vet student as well, even once you're in vet school, it becomes yeah. this imposter syndrome and things. But I think we need to move away from this idea that grades are the be all and end all and the defining factor. I really agree. And it just makes exams more stressful if, if you put a lot of importance in grades. So yeah, yeah, I think it's important to stress that there's the work experience component that's pretty important as well. Uh, I was curious to know what the entry requirement for Edinburgh was and do they have like a fixed amount of work experience that you have to complete before you apply? Yeah so it might, might have changed now. The entry requirements when I was applying to Edinburgh were four A's and a B at higher and that gave you a conditional offer for two B's at advanced higher. So that's the equivalent of moving from GCSEs to A levels being your advanced higher equivalent. And with that I think there's recommendation to do work experience and I know Edinburgh's interview process is slightly different. We operate MMIs, so multiple, I think it's many multiple interviews, and in that they will ask kind of generally about your experience of application and, and work experience as well as your academics and things like that. Oh, I see. Okay. So once you've applied, you have to do an interview first before you get a conditional offer. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you, you apply um, via UCAS as with the other universities. And once you've kind of got your application through, the next process is, is being offered an interview and from there after the interview you can be offered a conditional offer based on the, the grades that you're due to be expected to get whilst you're still setting exams. Cool. So what was the MMI like and did you have to do a lot of preparation for it? Any um, advice or tips? <laughs> I, I would say again that my two years out in full-time work really helped me because it developed other skills and I was akin to the, the experience of interviews in that sense. The structure of the MMIs is actually, some people love it, some people hate it. It's a bit like Marmite. Um, <laughs> Marmite. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of seven short stations of about a minute and a half and you have kind of different tasks. So it might be one task on some drug calculations, kind of simple maths, another on kind of a wee practical skill like origami just to see if you 
you can oh, follow. Oh, really? Them. Sounds fun. And the rest are all, yeah, exactly. And the rest are all based on interaction with staff of the university that may run through For example, I had a scenario-based circumstance of what I would do in a certain situation. I had another staff member kind of chatting to me about my personal statement from UCAS Mm -hmm. and kind of things like that. And it creates quite a well-rounded structure to the whole process. I think it covers a lot of different bases. So where you're maybe stronger in some and weaker in others, it it kind of amalgamates it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And do you have to do like a a maths test or like a chemistry sort of test during the multiple mini interviews? There's nothing additional, but one of the states from memory as a simple kind of drug calculation ah. so nothing you wouldn't have done already at a level I think it's just simply to show kind of a coherent approach to, to simple math and kind of what you would be expected when you go out to practice sounds like they put a practical approach to it besides just like you know one-on-one interviewing and getting to know you so that's yeah and I, I think practical. i think the real benefit for me and, and this sounds this sounds so silly and so stupid but when i walked into my interview i so i was slightly slightly older as i said slightly more experienced perhaps and having done interviews for work and things and I can vividly remember traveling through that day after taking a holiday from work and it was almost the the tunnel vision mindset of this is a moment let's get set let's get going and I'd really reiterate to any applicants that interviews can seem daunting Mm -hmm. but like we said that the grades don't perhaps aren't the the deciding factor in themselves it's just another step to add to your personal kind of profile and Mm -hmm. really boost your application if you can come across and you're in interviews well it'll really boost you so I ended up I remember vividly walking through the door into the room of these seven stations almost like I was running onto a rugby pitch every Saturday kind of rolling (laughs) my shoulders warming up getting ready like I was I was so focused and I remember my first station was a simple kind of origami station and without going into too much detail I made a mistake so it was about one minute in 30 seconds left in the timer for this task and I looked down and I thought I've done something wrong here I had a quick moment, I thought, either take this origami piece apart and try redo it in the correct way. So I'd twist it to the right rather than to the left with the paper, Uh or else I leave it as it is, and it's perfect, but imperfect at the same time. Uh And I decided, I was thinking intuitively, I was like, well, what do they want to see? So took it apart, redid it, but in the correct direction. And to this day, I swear, because there was someone watching me do it, I think that was the one reason I got in was the, the intuition of correcting my mistake in, in that interview. And it's just a small thing, but I think it's something that from the interview process, I always remember that having just an awareness of what's going on in the bigger picture, rather than just this kind of pent up worry over over the interviews itself and not being able to come across as, as you would usually. If oh, that makes I see. Sense. Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. So like, in essence, they want to know your values as well. And like, what would you do in a difficult situation? So yeah, so like, for example, the MMIs, they do ethics situations, they do Ah, personal mm -hmm. life experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And as I said, I think it creates quite a well-rounded and and whole kind of approach to the the interview process. And Mm -hmm. it's all different staff as well, which is really useful because perhaps you have one that's had a long day, not had enough coffee and a bit (laughs) of an irate mood. And it's a difference compared to a one-on-one interview for 50 minutes, an hour or so. Yeah, 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 definitely. Oh, that's really interesting. So cool. So I feel like we've pretty much covered the application advice section of this interview. And I guess it goes to show that there really is not only one way to go into vet school and you can apply again. And they don't they don't penalize you for applying more than one time, right? You can definitely No, definitely not. Definitely not. In fact, there's um a lot of amazing organizations that help kind of students that have perhaps been given the wrong academic advice or not had the same opportunities in trying to fulfill aspirations in, in reaching veterinary medicine, um, and yeah. whether that comes from their kind of socioeconomic background or such factors and I'd like in terms of opportunities of getting involved in societies and committees I'm now part of BVED uh-huh. um, which operate an mentorship scheme and it's something I, I've a real love for now is is trying to pass the torch in the profession and even though we are only students at this stage I think it's so important that we have a role to play. It's early days, yeah. but we're already receiving the the knowledge and the practical skills from those that are already graduated. So I don't see why as students, we can't help out people that want to get to where we are now. Yeah, definitely. What is this BVEDS scheme that you are talking about? So BVEDS is the British 
Veterinary Ethnicity and Diversity Society. Uh -huh. Its um, its main main aim is to increase uh, diversity within the veterinary profession. Um, so they're involved in a lot of the, the lobbying for policy change, um, not just for students for for the the general profession, whether that be those in academia and research and general practice, uh -huh. um, and really trying to create an inclusive environment. And I think. They now have student chapters in most vet schools and it's amazing to see because I think it creates a level of student engagement that previously wasn't there and hopefully only continues to grow. Yeah, I think they have a Facebook page as well, don't they? Yeah, so they've got Facebook pages and um, they've got kind of closed forum groups. They actually run book clubs, which I'm a big fan of, oh, um, kind cool. of reading on, on topical texts that mm -hmm. are, are kind of to the group and things so definitely one to, to join if you're interested yeah cool i'll definitely put that in the link so people can find that facebook group yep. yeah cool so the next thing is about your general experience in edinburgh and how is it like what's your favorite part about it any challenges you face what's it like living in edinburgh yeah yeah, yeah edinburgh is a, a beautiful city there's a lot of history to it it's, it's an older city so we've got a lot of kind of historic monument for example the castle mm -hmm. um, but at the same time it's it's becoming quite modern and there's a real buzz around the city with festivals mm -hmm. such as the fringe yeah so the, the kind of culture in the city around art and kind of comedy is is a big one as well as music mm -hmm. um, and although I am biased being from Glasgow um, <laughs> it's a bit of a rivalry I, I have fallen in love with the city Edinburgh is amazing for students as well and I have to admit it's quite a small city so you can pretty much walk everywhere but we've also got great transport links mm -hmm. um, in the bus systems and even with the vet school they subsidize our bus passes um, oh, wow. because, because because our campus is, is a wee bit outside of Edinburgh and the social scene as well so there's so many societies and clubs so many kind of open green spaces we have arthur's seat which is um, a large kind of hill with an amazing view we have blackford hill with the observatory and the meadows is a is a really large green space that if you can't tell i'm in my my rugby kit just back from rugby out running oh, about yeah. the only thing you need to do is time it right with the weather unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, generally, we're generally dry but maybe a bit colder than, than down south mm, i see the the winters can be quite cold though mm -mm. obviously north and being on the east coast as well yeah um, so if you're if you're coming up to edinburgh maybe bring an extra blanket <laughs> or an extra pair of uh, yeah Oh, I see. So in terms of your vet school, you mentioned that it's a little bit outside of the city or is it, do you have a main campus with other courses and then like a vet campus specifically? Um, and with relation to that, where do you live? Do you live at the vet school site or do you live in the city? So I think this is where Edinburgh presents quite a different structure to a lot of the universities. And again, it's one thing that comes up in a lot of discussions. So we have what we call a satellite campus at Easter Bush, which is about 35 minutes outside of Edinburgh. And when I say outside of Edinburgh, I mean rolling kind of fields out in the Pentlands, which is a group of hills. Some people enjoy that fact. It gives us the opportunity to be out on the university farms for placement and when we've got practicals but it does mean we have to travel out there mm -hmm. do you mean and 30 minutes by bus or 30 minutes by train or like cycling yeah so about 30 35 minutes by bus i would probably say that that's where the bus pass comes in that it's a necessity that the university helps subsidize by provision because they know we do need to travel mm -hmm. but people do cycle some <laughs> brave some brave souls do run <laughs> brave um, well run amazing yeah it's about seven from memory it's 7.2 miles it's a fair fair distance yeah <laughs> we generally as vet students will live mostly in in the city center in edinburgh and okay. travel out. The main reason for that is that most of the, the main university societies are here in the city centre. And if you're trying to keep a social circle that isn't just all vets, or perhaps you have work in the city, mm -hmm. if you're working part time, it's much easier. And the commute in itself, I quite enjoy, to be honest. I'm mm -hmm. not going to lie. People would probably tut and roll their eyes when I say this, but <laughs> it, I, I use it as a bit of time to just switch off a book or I'll listen to a podcast. And amongst what can be, I'm sure as you know, can be quite a hectic shed it's quite yeah. nice to swap everything for a bit yeah definitely i definitely do appreciate the downtime as well because well in cambridge we just cycle everywhere but even like a 15 minute cycle to and fro it gives you some time to just you know stare out and like you know enjoy the wind as you cycle and stuff like that yeah. i would have thought you would have caught is it a is it a bunt a bunting oh, on the... pun hunting 
Pan Ting, yes. Yeah, punting in the river. <laughs> yeah, punting down the river. Yeah, I do remember that. So I've been in Cambridge twice, so I've, I've seen the punters. Ah, oh, have you been punting before? No, I wasn't brave enough. Oh Definitely no, not. you should. It's, it's, it's not scary, don't worry. You, it's I'll very hard to, to follow. I'll stick to pedals. <laughs> you stick to pedals. Oh dear. Right. Yeah, so when you mentioned the hills and everything, I do remember that Edinburgh is a very good place for doing EMS, extramural studies, which are like placements um, for vet students. I remember someone saying that you can get a variety of farm placements, which is very hard to get, I find, when you're in Cambridge. So because you have to go all the way up north or like go to Wales and stuff like that. So what is EMS generally like in Edinburgh? Yeah, so I'm actually on EMS right now. Um, are you? I'm, Where? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I'm doing smallies right now. Ah. Um, so smallies <laughs> vets in this, uh, just outside of Edinburgh, to the west of Edinburgh. Cool. But in terms of, of farm practice, you are quite well suited as well because Scotland in general has two kind of major cities in, in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and you've obviously got kind of Dundee, Aberdeen, Inverness. Mm -hmm. But um, you're quite close to the borders, so heading that back down towards England, where it is all kind of farming country. And even as you cross the Firth of Forth, which is a kind of river like body of water, you reach a constituency called Fife, which is again kind of very much farming area. So you do have an opportunity for quite varied EMS and you also have Edinburgh Zoo close by if you're into your wildlife. Oh, um, yeah. I do I do know we have quite an active um, conservation society that pairs up with the zoo and does quite a few talks and things like that and we have quite a lot of interaction with them. I'd probably say though that the, the big bonus of being in Edinburgh is that we have a fantastic equine facility and we also have have a dedicated exotics unit that we can go for EMS as well as the SSPCA being paired with a ward in the small animal hospital. So it really brings together a really varied opportunity for animals to work with on EMS, I think. Oh, that's really cool. Is that one of the reasons why you applied to Edinburgh in the first place? For me, so I didn't look down south of the border. Shamefully, the tuition fee status in Scotland means that I don't pay tuition fees as a Scottish oh, yeah. resident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to to study veterinary if I went down south. So when the offer came knocking from Edinburgh, I, I bit the hand off straight away. And I think I was quite right to, and how I've described it as being a bit of a harmony. The opportunities it's opened in terms of societies and meeting people and, and opportunities just in general. I think the one of the deciding factors for me in Edinburgh though, was coming back to the city. You do get a real vibe of a student kind of community, something going on in the city with like a kind of buzz and an atmosphere. And that's something Thing I, I kind of craved moving away from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I see. So I guess a little bit about the logistics of things. How much is rent usually in Edinburgh? And do you apply to the university for accommodation or do you rent privately in the city? and stuff so would, would this be for first year or, or just in general uh in in first year and then after that yeah so in first year most people will generally be in university accommodation and it's generally university owned but there is also independent organizations that that kind of provide student accommodation and i think it's it's a good way for meeting other students and, and mm -hmm. kind of building that social circle when everything's new about the city you're all experiencing moving away from home at the same time mm -hmm. Uh, I, I stayed in student accommodation in, in my first year. However, when you kind of progress through the years, you generally move into flats. Mm -hmm. So Edinburgh has what we call tenement buildings. that are kind of old sandstone buildings that are probably a couple hundred years old in some places. Wow. As you can see probably from behind me with the window, it's kind of very old fashioned, tall standing windows. So we all move into flats. And with my experience with AVS, which is the Association of Veterinary Students, mm -hmm. Uh, we do a survey every four years and in 2016, I'm not sure about the most recent this year's, Edinburgh was second only to London in terms of uh, cost for accommodation. So it is an, it is an expensive city to live in. Oh. Uh, but that said, there are sometimes cases where you can find rooms that are bills included and, and at a reasonable price. but compared to perhaps down south at uh, some of the other vet schools that I know where you're getting semi-detached houses for far less than we get for one room in a four bed flat and be quite problematic for, for finances. Mm, I see. I guess it depends. Yeah, it depends where you go. Would you be able to give like a rough range of the rent and stuff? 
you're probably talking anywhere from about 430, 440 being the, the cheapest, like cheaper end of the scale. I've heard of people paying all the way up to 650 and, and that can vary in what you're getting, um, whether it's two bed flat, four bed flat, mm -hmm. whether bills are included and it can be private landlords or, or not. We're really lucky in the vet school actually that we do have this kind of satellite campus and it, it creates its own community amongst vet students. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of flats that are passed down through the years and it means that the landlords are very supportive of making sure that knowing the vet students have additional costs that and, and obviously not being able to work during their holidays with EMS. Yeah, yeah. That they provide for us in terms of making sure that flats are reasonable compared to others and try and really make sure that we're looked out for yeah that, that's really nice what was the what is a satellite campus so, so when i say satellite campus i'm just meaning a campus away from the main university campus oh i see okay yeah fair enough so, yeah um, our main university campus is kind of city centre of Edinburgh yeah, yeah. of George Square where most of the courses are taught and just because our campus is outside of Edinburgh we often refer to it as satellite. So in terms of like being able to socialise with uh, students who are non-vet students do you find that the work-life balance of the vet degree gives you that time to actually join clubs and societies to like interact with other students? Mm -hmm. How is that? How is that like? Yeah so I think my experience is I've always been very active in joining societies so mm -hmm. i joke that i'll finish my degree with a bachelor of veterinary medicine and surgery but also a degree in juggling <laughs> um, just, in, just in the number of societies and committees i join and i think that you really make the most of your own experience in joining societies and committees and i keep the perspective when i joined that i was only going to be doing this once so I may as well make the most and, and kind of really dive in the deep end. So I think that the, the social aspect is, is definitely manageable with a vet degree. All in good measure, like don't get me wrong, you, you do need to work hard. Yeah. Um, but I think it's very much keeping pace and knowing when to, to kind of put the pedal down and when to ease off and make sure that you do look after yourself with the right balance. So for example, I highly advocate joining a sports society mm -hmm. just to <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, or if you're not sporty, then doing something maybe like in the vet school, we have the, the Dick Vet Musicians, which oh. uh, hold concerts and, and regular meetups, or we have the Exmoor Pony Trekking Society that keep the keep Exmoor ponies and, and go up into the Pentlands, oh, which is so cool. Thing. I want to go pony trekking. Yeah, and, and they do it for the public as well. So they, they run treks that people can book out for, for taking children and, and friends out on. So there's plenty mm -hmm. to do. And I think the one thing I've found is that vet school can almost be a bubble in itself. And the same chat and having a group of friends or a society is perhaps not from vet school or kind of vet groups is very useful. So when I talk about rugby, I actually play for the medics. Oh, uh, medics, which, no. Uh, yeah, that, that old <laughs> we rivalry. don't like medics. <laughs> yeah, that old rivalry. So it's it's a good change of chat and I, I find it quite refreshing to be honest. Yeah. And it lets me just completely switch off from anything vet related. Yeah, I think that's very important. Yeah, definitely. When you hang out with vets, even though you don't want to talk about work, it somehow sometimes always ends up being vet chat, if you go what I mean. So yeah. Yeah, so we have a we have a rule for vet chat that <laughs> We, when we go on a night out, if anyone brings up vet chat, they have to take two fingers from their drink so that they start start getting progressively drunker and drunker, <laughs> um, and they quickly they quickly learn their lesson. So that is a that is a good rule. Um, <laughs> so I guess a little bit more on the academics of the vet course. I was just wondering how big your cohort is and how lectures are being carried out, and maybe a little bit of if you know how COVID is gonna change how you do lectures now. In Edinburgh, we run a different system to most vet schools again. So oh, we're okay. we're a bit of a rogue vet school. Ooh. So we run our years as being species-based rather oh. than systems. -based. So what we find is that our first two years are non-clinical and our years three and four are clinical with our rotations and final year. So essentially what happens is that we go through our non-clinical years learning anatomy, histology, cell biology. Yeah. Then we go into second year that covers all the kind of body systems mm -hmm. um, and the idea is to learn what's normal before learning what's abnormal yeah so that then sets us up well for 
were entering third year, where we then go into kind of clinical foundation course, which is all the kind of prerequisite and understanding the, the clinical practice. So all your kind of pharmacology and drugs. Mm -hmm. And then that's where we really get onto the good stuff after Christmas and third year, when we split into species and we learn cat and dog, continued in fourth year with farm, veterinary public health, equine and exotics. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a different system and with that we have a good balance of lectures, practicals and tutorials and for the most part these would all be done in person but obviously with the restrictions now it creates quite an unprecedented circumstance that I, I think everyone's still trying to work out the best approach. Mm -hmm. So for the, for the most part we've been told that lectures will be online. Okay. To really minimise the risk of transmission of, of COVID and, mm -hmm. and kind of congregation of large groups. However, the university has been really active in trying to make sure that we're supported and in, in getting our practical classes. One thing about Edinburgh is that we are a, a, a practical based course, mm -hmm. which I have found very useful in consolidating the theory and really kind of making sure that when we go out on EMS or, or once we do eventually graduate, we've been there, done it and got the t-shirt. We've at least had attempts at, at, at doing these kind of practical manual skills. Mm -hmm. So we have a structure right now that we are in one day a week per year group. And from that, I think it's gonna, no one quite knows how it's gonna operate because we've not started back yet. We start back next week. Oh, but, um, exciting. Yeah, exactly. I'm hopeful that it turns out well because I can see the, the endeavours made by staff and, and students as well that have been involved in the process of trying to reorganise the curriculum um, yeah. and credit where credit's due. It's been a short turnaround. So I think there definitely needs to be a, a commendation there for, for those that have made those efforts. Yeah, definitely. And what do you mean by, uh, so one day a week you go back to vet school and then... So for example, fourth years would say be a Tuesday it would ah, be their dedicated okay. day. Yeah. And even, even with that, coming back to your question about cohorts, the average cohort starting in vet school is about 110. But in third year, we do amalgamate with our graduate entry program. Mm -hmm. So these are students that have done degrees previously. Um, and generally, their cohort is an accelerated program that yep. covers the first two years in one year. Oh, wow. And they join us in third year to make a cohort of about 170. So it's it's another another kind of step of you come into the clinical years, but you've also got a, an enlarged cohort of, of new faces and kind of new friends, yeah. um, which I, I quite enjoyed. I thought it added to, to a lot that it changed the, the kind of dynamics and social circles as well. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I think that Edinburgh's quite quite well based in that and the, the kind of curriculum side of things. And I, I've enjoyed the course thoroughly. The species specific based aspect has really mm -hmm. suited me, especially with doing my smallies placement over summer. Well, what I could do, because I had quite a lot canceled. It really helped me to, to narrow down on, on specific aspects and be able to concentrate on that before I move on to doing farm or, or equine next year. That's really interesting. Yeah, I think, yeah, Cambridge does it in system base and this is the first time I'm hearing that your vet school does species base. So, oh, that's really interesting. Cool. So do you have to organize your own EMS or does the university arrange it for you? We organize it ourselves. Okay. We are given some assistance. So in the vet school library, we do have kind of ring binders with contact details of placements uh, okay. yeah. um, that previous students have recommended. But generally, I think most students go on placement from word of mouth or else mm. it's somewhere that is kind of close to home. I did most of my placement locally to Glasgow back home to, to try to save some money and secretly enjoy home comforts such as a full <laughs> bed and get home and see the dog and yeah, and yeah just good parents felt appreciated mm. but um yeah we're we're expected to organize ourselves okay um, and we kind of undertake those placements ourselves once approved by our ems yep. coordinators yep. Um, and then we have to give a certificate of attendance and um, that is signed yep. by the placement provider just to make sure that we've we've been there, done our kind of number of hours required and give a bit of feedback on, on how we've done. Cool, yeah, we have a sort of similar system to that. So yeah, so I guess that was pretty much, I think we pretty much covered everything quite quickly about um, Edinburgh University. 